Um, so what we are doing today is that we are um, digging deeper in this hierarchy of majoritarian social choice functions. So we are on one of these escape routes from errors and possibility where the idea is that rather than having contraction and expansion consistency at the same time, we only take expansion consistency, um, and in the case, for instance, of the strongest expansion consistency condition, beta plus, this led us to the top cycle because it is characterized as the finest um, social choice function that satisfies beta plus. And then um, in the last lecture before the Christmas break, we had a similar characterization for the uncovered set, which was shown to be the finest majoritarian social choice function that satisfies gamma. And in today's lecture, we will discuss two more social choice functions of this kind, um, where we are further weakening expansion consistency from gamma to even weaker conditions. So those two conditions studied today will be uh, called rho plus and rho. So two more, or one more Greek letter, one with a plus, because it's the stronger property. And the two social choice functions that we are discussing are called the bank set and the tournament equilibrium set. So what first, uh, what we are doing is we are weakening gamma one step further to this rho plus condition. And as before, this will lead us to a unique characterization using this uh, refinement notion. Um, and this social choice function is called the bank set. OK, so the bank set was proposed by, well, Jeffrey Banks. That's why it's called the bank set. Um, so Banks was a political scientist um, who unfortunately passed away very young. So I think at the age of 41 already. So he might have achieved much or many more um, great things in political science if he had lived longer. Um, the bank set, just like the top cycle and the uncovered set, is based on an auxiliary notion. So if you recall, for the top cycle, we first needed the notion of a dominant set. So a set is dominant if everything in the set dominates everything outside. For the uncovered set, we needed this auxiliary notion of a covering relation. A covering relation is a subrelation of the dominance relation. And for the bank set, we need the notion of a transitive subset of vertices. So here, again, we are talking about only tournaments, so there are no majority ties. And a set of vertices is called transitive if the majority relation restricted to the subset is transitive. OK, so um, the idea for defining the bank set is somewhat similar to what we also had for the uncovered set. So if you recall, for the uncovered set, I did mention briefly that there's an alternative definition of the uncovered set, where we just say we take the maximal elements of the inclusion maximal subtournaments that have a maximal element, so the largest subtournaments that admit a Condorcet winner. So that was, uh, I didn't prove that this is equivalent to the uncovered set, but you could trust me on that. So this, is, this exactly leads to the uncovered set. So if you look at a tournament, and the problem in general is Condorcet winners don't always exist, so therefore we could just look at the largest subtournaments that do have Condorcet winners and then just take all of these. So in each largest subtournament, there's a Condorcet winner, and then taking all of these together led to the uncovered set. And the idea for the bank set is very similar. Because here the idea is just that we do not only restrict attention to subtournaments that have a Condorcet winner, but to subtournaments for which the entire relation is transitive. Okay, so this is more restrictive um, once you have um, at least four vertices. Because if you have four vertices, you could have a Condorcet winner and then a three cycle below, these, below this Condorcet winner. Okay, so and then this tournament would have a Condorcet winner, but it's not transitive because there's a three cycle. The nice thing about tournaments, I think I mentioned it before the Christmas break, is, is that transitivity is exactly the same thing as saying that there are no three cycles or no cycles in general. So transitive tournament is a tournament that has no cycles because all of these three notions, transitivity, quasi-transitivity, and acyclicity, they all coincide for tournaments. Okay, so therefore the idea for the bank set is, is that we look at the largest tournaments that are transitive, the largest sub-tournaments that are transitive, and from each of these tournaments we take the Condorcet winner, because all of these tournaments will have a Condorcet winner if they are completely transitive. Um, and you could motivate, for instance, this assumption of looking at transitive tournaments by saying that um, if, for instance, you have a tournament that has a Condorcet winner and a three cycle beyond, so this tournament has a Condorcet winner, but there are sub-tournaments which don't have a Condorcet winner. For instance, if you, well, or exactly if you delete the Condorcet winner, but then it's, there's still a cycle there. And the transitive tournament is characterized by the fact that every subtournament has a Condorcet winner. Okay, so a tournament is transitive if and only if every subtournament has a Condorcet winner. Okay. Um, and in order to, to argue about transitive subsets of vertices in tournaments, 
We need some notation, of course, um, which, by the way, also is again uploaded in this document on Moodle, where you can see the updated notation for each of the lectures. So we denote by trends of a tournament the set of transitive subsets in a tournament. Okay, so of course, this, so this again is a set of sets, so a set of vertices for which the majority relation is transitive. The set is non-empty for every tournament. We can always find trivial transitive sub-tournaments. If you look at singleton tournaments, for instance, if you look at tournaments that only have two vertices, it will always be transitive, trivially, because well, a violation of transitivity requires at least three alternatives. Once we go to three or more alternatives, some tournaments are transitive and some are not. So because there can be a three cycle or a three transitive tournament. Okay, and as I said, so the idea for the bank set is then to just look at the largest sub-tournaments for which the majority relation is transitive and then take the Condorcet winner of each of these sub-tournaments. So formally we have the following here. Um, so the bank set of a tournament is defined as follows. So we take the maximal element according to the majority relation in some subset B. Okay, and what is B? Well, B is just an element of this set here. Um, so, yeah, so this might be a bit uh, maybe confusing if you see this at first. So trans is the set of transitive sets. Okay, this contains many sets of alternatives or vertices from the tournament. And then we look at the largest ones. So we take the, um, the, the superset relation, which is just a binary relation, and then the max operator applied to this superset relation just gives us the inclusion maximal transitive sets. Okay, so B is just an inclusion maximal transitive set. And what do I mean by inclusion maximal? So it just means that we cannot add another alternative such that the tournament is still transitive or that the set is still transitive. So inclusion maximal just means it's impossible to add another vertex such that the set is still transitive. So I'm always emphasizing inclusion here because there's also, of course, this notion of absolute or, or cardinality maximality. So you can also look at the largest subset of vertices which is transitive in terms of the number of vertices contained in the set. Okay, so th this is not important here. So here we only have inclusion maximality, so it should be impossible to add another vertex such that the subset is still transitive. Okay, so B here is a maximal transitive set. And um, then what we do take is the maximal element because any transitive subset admits a maximal element and then we take the maximal element of this subset. And we do this for all inclusion maximal transitive subsets. Okay, um, maybe just a quick example because I'm not sure whether everybody got what I'm talking about here. So if we, for instance, look at the three cycle here. Okay, so then... Um, what would be, so let's give these alternatives names, A, B, C. Um, so what would be an inclusion maximal transitive subset in this tournament? So obviously the entire tournament A, B, C um, is, is not transitive, it's cyclic. So what would be an inclusion maximal transitive subset here? Yes? Yes, so all three of them, A, B, A, C, and B, C. Okay, so all two element subsets. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, so this, for instance, would be an inclusion maximal transitive subset. Because if we add C, well, then it's not transitive anymore. And that means, so in each of these subsets, there, there is a maximal element. One of them has A as a maximal element, another one B, another one C. So um, what the bank set would return for the three cycle would be the three alternatives A, B, C. And well, basically every majoritarian function has to do so just because of the system symmetry of this tournament. Okay, um, so this is how the bank set is defined. Um, so there's an, like a, you can think of this as an either a characterization or an alternative definition of the bank set. Um, and that's the following statement here. So you can think of this as a, as, as a, de as a definition because here I'm saying that X is contained in the bank set if and only if the following statement here is true. Um, so here I'm saying that X is contained in the bank set if there is some transitive set B. Okay, note that this set doesn't have to be inclusion maximal here. So I'm just saying there's an, an transitive subset of vertices such that X is the maximal element of the set and there is no other alternative A which dominates all the alternatives in B. Okay, so what this means is that the set B here that we are talking about, um, maybe let's draw it like this. This is the set B. 
x is the maximal element, that's why uh, the maximal element in this subset, that's why I'm drawing it on top. And um, here it's not claimed that b is inclusion maximal, it's only required that there is no other alternative a which dominates x and all the other alternatives in b. Okay, there should be no such alternative A, which is now drawn in, in blue here. And why is this different from inclusion maximality? Well, because there could be other alternatives, maybe Y here, which, for instance, are dominated by everything in B. So it is possible that this... Well, this is really ugly. Let's draw it a bit nicer. Okay, so there could be some alternative Y which is dominated by everything in B. So which means that this set B doesn't need to be inclusion maximal because we can add alternatives maybe at the bottom or maybe something below X, um, but not on top of X. So the important distinction here is um, that if X is a maximal element or a Condorcet winner of a transitive sub such that there is no alternative which can extend this subset on top so if it, if it can be extended from above by some alternative which, which is even stronger than X, then this is already sufficient for, for X to be a member of the bank set. Okay, so it's um, because these extra alternatives here below, they could make this transitive set B even larger, but if there's no such A as it, as it is depicted here, it doesn't make a different difference. Okay, so it, an alternative is in the bank set, if and only if there's a transitive set for which X is the maximal element and there is no other alternative that dominates everything in this transitive set. It may be possible if there are other alternatives um, that, are, that are weaker than X that can make this transitive set larger, but the important thing is just whether we, whether we can extend it from above um, such that there would be a different maximal alternative. Okay? Because if there would be such an A here, well, then we would have found a transitive set which is larger than the first one, and it has a different maximal element. Okay, so this is the idea why we have, so I'm not formally proving this if, if and only if uh, characterization here, because I would hope that this argument is enough here. Um, and it, it sometimes makes arguing about the bank set a bit simpler. Okay, so the, the important notion whether a transitive sub can be extended or not is, is only if whether we can find um, an alternative which dominates everything in the transitive set, such that the new maximal element would be different from the previous one. Okay, so of course I'm going to show you examples well, beyond this three cycle here where you can play around with the bank set um, and get more intuition into this concept. Um, okay, so let's check. I wanted to say something else. Ah yeah, okay, so um, one important question that we always ask ourselves, well, well at least I do, and I hope you do too, um, um, when we learn about new majoritarian social choice functions is whether they are Condorcet consistent. Okay. Um, so that might be the first thing we could check for the bank set. So is it Condorcet consistent? If there's a Condorcet winner, will this Condorcet winner be selected? Okay, and in order to... Okay, let's maybe erase this stuff here. To get some concrete intuition, let's assume we have Condorcet winner X, dominates everything below. Um, will this alternative be returned by the bank set or not? Any ideas? Yes? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, so you can so that you can take a very small two-element subset um, which is transitive, so x plus some other alternative, and then it's already clear that if you look at this second definition here, that you cannot find another alternative which dominates x and this other alternative because because it already um, you, you will already not find an alternative which dominates x in the first place, right? So therefore, as you said correctly, x uh, will be returned um, if um, x is a Condorcet winner. How about any other alternatives? Is it possible that other alternatives are returned on top of X? Right? Because for Condorcet consistency, it's only required that X is among the winners. But in principle, Condorcet consistency would, st would still be satisfied if there are also other alternatives. Oh, no, no, no. Condor the, the way we define... Oh, now I was a bit confused. Sorry about that. So sometimes in the literature, Condorcet consistency is defined in a weaker sense. The way we define it is if there is a Condorcet winner, then only the Condorcet winner will be returned. So we, we do need to check whether no other alternatives 
can be returned. Okay, so the argument that you gave shows that X is in the bank set. Now the question is whether other alternatives can also be in the bank set if X is the Condorcet winner. No? Okay, why not? Yes? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so yeah, let me paraphrase this maybe a bit differently. So it's if we, if we, if there was some other alternative which is the maximal element of some transitive set, so there could be some alternatives down here which form a transitive set, then any of these transitive sets can be extended by X from above even. So X dominates this green set, any of these green sets, um, and then X would be a different maximal element. So, so any transitive set which has some maximal element can always be extended by adding X, and therefore only X will be returned, exactly. Um, so we have already proven um, that uh, Banks is a Condorcet extension, which is the uh, well, first nice property. And now uh, let's look at some uh, like more intricate examples than the three cycle, just to get some more intuition. And maybe at this point, it, ma it also makes sense, maybe because we had this long Christmas break, to repeat or, or recap the definitions of the other majoritarian functions we had, because those will be compared against the bank set. So we want to compare to the top cycle and the uncovered set. Um, so this tournament here, as I have mentioned before, is the only interesting tournament on four vertices. We have seen it a couple of times already. Um, maybe just to warm up a quick question, so what would be the top cycle of this tournament here? Which alternatives would be in the top cycle? Yes? Right. Um, so there are several ways how we could uh, identify those alternatives. So for instance, uh, we could uh, maybe draw the Copeland score for each of these alternatives and write it down. So these two alternatives have a Copeland score of two, these of one, okay, and then we already know that the elements in the Copeland set are contained in the top cycle, and then we could use this iterative algorithm for computing the top cycle. That seems a bit uh, like too much for the simple example, because by now I guess many of you have enough intuition to already see that the top cycle would be ABCD, but you're perfectly right, the top cycle here would be ABCD, and by the way, we have now also identified the Copeland winners, which would, which would be alternatives A and C, because they have a score of two. Um, how about the uncovered set? Yes? Right? Um, how did you find it? Or did you just remember the, the same term I from before? <laughs> Yes, perfect. Okay, so you can either take the covering relation or you can check this two steps principle or the kinks. And as you said, so I'm just repeating what you said for the for the recording. Um, so D doesn't reach C in, in two steps, as you can tell from this tournament. So therefore, the uncovered set consists of A, B, and C. Um, okay, now how about the bank set? So that's the, the new tournament solution or majoritarian social choice function that we are studying here. So any ideas of which alternative is, so the, the bank set always has to contain at least one alternative, like every social choice function. Which alternatives or which alternative should be in the bank set? So the maximal elements of inclusion maximal transitive subtournaments. Okay, A and C. So maybe let's first let's do one by one. Um, okay, so you said A is in the bank set, so you see some transitive set in which A is a maximal element. A. Yes, A C D. That's uh, a three-element transitive subset, and clearly it's inclusion maximal because if we add B, well then there's not only one cycle but even two cycles, um, at or even four, uh, three cycles. Yeah. Anyway, so it's uh, once we add B. It's not transitive anymore. That, therefore, B, uh, A is contained in the bank set. And then you said C, I think? Yeah. 
CDB, yes, exactly. It's like the same argument. So it's again a three transitive, um, uh, uh, a transitive tournament of size three. So A and C are contained in the bank set. Any other alternative? Yes? Yeah? Perfect. Yes, excellent. So, so, so BA is a transitive set. It's smaller than the previous two um, that we used, but still, of course, it's a transitive set. And whenever we add C or D to this two-element subtournament, then we would have a three-cycle. So therefore, B is also in the bank set. Um, okay, so now we know A, B, C are in the bank set. How about D? Um, so if e either it's in the bank set or if it's not, we need to find some argument why it's not in the bank set. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so what you said is that there's no three element sub tournament in which D is the controversy winner, but it doesn't need to be a three element sub tournament, right? So, like. Yes? Yes, but for, for B, for instance, it was only a two-element subset, right? So it was only A, B. So, it, so we do need to check whether D, B is, uh, so that's surely transitive, but we do need to check whether it's inclusion maximal, um, a, an inclusion maximal transitive subset. And is it an inclusion maximal transitive subset? No. Why? Which alternative can be used to extend it? Yes, exactly, right? Okay, so and it can even be extended from top, so which is what we discussed on the previous slide. So therefore, A is in the bank set, B is in the bank set, C, and D is not. So the bank set in this example is the same as the uncovered set. So it didn't bring us much progress for this particular example. Um, but as we will see in other examples, um, it will um, select a strict subset of the uncovered set. I guess I can re reveal that already at this time. So we are going to prove formally that the bank set is always a subset of the uncovered set. Um, and um, yeah, we will, we will see, for instance, in this example, that the bank set does actually something uh, which is a bit more interesting than what the uncovered set does. Um, maybe again, quickly, uh, not to take too much time, Let's also look at the top cycle and uncovered set for this tournament here. So this uses the special notation, which for larger tournaments is always very useful, which we introduced before the Christmas break. So all edges from top to bottom are omitted. Okay, so for instance, A dominates F, A dominates G, D dominates E, F, and G, and so on. So what's the top cycle here? So let me... I'm writing down the Copeland scores here. Okay, so those those three have a score of four. Um, those a score of two, and this one is a score of three. Right. So what we can do in order to find the top cycle, so we start with the Copeland winners, that is our standard algorithm, and then we add everything that points into the current working set. Okay, so once we start with the Copeland winners, A, B, C, we would add E, F, G, okay, because they point inside of the current working set. And are we done at this point? No, right? And because then we also need to add D, and well, the top cycle is notorious for selecting many alternatives, and that shows that in this example, the top cycle, as in many other examples, selects everything. Um, now the uncovered set. Um, so at least for me, it's usually simpler to check the two steps principle rather than constructing the covering relation. So we need to check which alternatives reach all the other alternatives in at most two steps. The nice thing about this tournament here is that, that we have some symmetries here. So it's hopefully obvious that once we check whether A is, uh, is in the uncovered set, well, then we know that also B and C are in the uncovered set, right? Or if we know that E is not in the uncovered set, we also know that F and G are not in the uncovered set because they are completely symmetric here. Um, so which alternatives would be in the uncovered set? Yes? 
Okay, well, that was quick, but it uh, looks good. Um, so A, B, C. So as I said, we only need to check for A. Okay, so A uh, well, reaches B directly and C in two steps. It reaches F and G also directly. It reaches D directly and, and E. We don't get directly, but we can go via D, and therefore A reaches everything in two steps, and therefore also B and C. It's just a symmetric argument. And you also mentioned D. Well, D dominates E, F, and G directly. Well, and using these upward edges here, we can also get A, B, and C, right? Like this, like that, and like this. Okay, A, B, C, D are in the uncovered set. Um, now we need to check um, to, to verify your claim that E is not in the uncovered set. Um, so it should, there should be some alternative that E doesn't reach in two steps. And that is the alternative that covers E. Which one would that be? It should be C. Okay, so. Um, Yes, exactly, right? So E reaches everything in, in one or two steps, except alternative C. Right? We, can, we can even reach D if we go to A up here and then to D. But A doesn't, uh, E doesn't reach C, and F doesn't reach A, I guess, and G doesn't reach B. So for each of these alternatives, there's one alternative that cannot be reached in two steps. And therefore, the uncovered set contains alternatives A, B, C, D. Um, now the, uh, the, the bank set. Now things become a bit trickier. So we need to find inclusion maximal tournaments for which um, the, a given alternative is a maximal element. So maybe let me start by looking at A here. So if we want to find a tournament in which uh, there are no cycles and which has A as a maximal element, well, we can add, for instance, B here. So we cannot add both B and C because then, of course, there would be a three cycle. So let's take A, B, D. We can easily add as well. Um, and, and then G, for instance. Okay. Um, A, B, D, G. Um, is there any alternative that dominates A, B, D, G? No, right? And, and therefore, A is in the bank set because we have this four element transitive sub tournament. Um, which cannot be extended. And um, this one is even inclusion maximal, but using this equivalent definition, we could have also taken a much smaller one. So if we just take A and B, that's a two element set which is transitive, it can, it can be extended from below. This, this is what I meant earlier by adding D and G, for instance, but it doesn't change the maximal element, so it's not really important. The important thing is that it cannot be extended from above. So if we take A and B, we have a transitive set, but there's no alternative which dominates both A and B. Right, so because the only element that dominates um, A would be C, and C doesn't dominate B. Okay, and the same argument holds for, for B and C, of course, so therefore A, B, and C are contained in the bank set. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, let's just skip those ones down here. So, so those here um, are not in the bank set. Well, I mentioned already that we are going to show that the bank set is a subset of the uncovered set, so you can easily extend all transitive sets in which any of these alternatives is, is maximal by, um, by using some, some other alternative. Um, but let's look at alternative D here, because that's the interesting case here. So is D contained in the bank set or not? So if it is in the bank set, we need to find an inclusion maximal subtournament in which D is maximal. Pardon me? DGE, for instance, sure. So that would be an inclusion maximal tournament in which D is maximal. Okay, so we cannot take all three of these because then they would form a cycle. So we can only take two. Any two would actually do. So you, you said DGE, but we could also take DEF, whatever. But let's stick with DGE. So is there some alternative that dominates DGE? Yes, B does, right? And by the same reasoning, we, for any two elements we pick down here, we can find something on top there which dominates the transitive set in which D is a maximal element. Or in other words, every transitive tournament in which D is a maximal element can be extended from above by picking the, the right of these three alternatives here, the, the correct one. Um, and that shows that alternative D is not contained in the bank set. Well, otherwise, probably I wouldn't have picked this example here because now we have an example where the bank set is actually strictly smaller than the uncovered set. 
And interestingly, so this is the smallest tournament for which it, this is the case. So it already requires seven alternatives to make the bank set strictly smaller than the uncovered set. And we will realize once we dig deeper in this hierarchy of majoritarian functions that in many cases we will, let, we will have to find large counterexamples to, to disprove certain things. All right, okay, so the bank set um, in this example consists of ABC, and I think by now you have understood how, um, how the bank set works. And of course, well, then the next things we are doing with the bank set is, um, well, first proving an axiomatic characterization. So I promised that this is on this escape route, so I haven't even defined this row plus condition. Um, and once we have done that, of course, we will look at the computational complexity of the bank set. So for the top cycle and the uncovered set, we had positive results. We could compute both of these efficiently. And we have actually used these methods for the example here. So we can take the Copeland winners and then just add alternatives to get the top cycle. For the uncovered set, we uh, take the two steps principle. For the bank set, you can maybe, if you have some extra time left at the, in, at the back of your head, maybe you can try to think about whether um, there is some method of, of identifying banks winners efficiently. Okay, but now uh, let's talk about this strong retentiveness notion. So this is uh, like the verbal description of this axiom called row plus. So at, at this point, the definition probably seems rather technical. So it's it's not so as, so it's it's a weakening of gamma. So in beta plus and gamma, we have motivated using choice theory. Um, so here, the, the definition maybe seems a bit arbitrary, but at least it's it's short. Um, so let's let me go th uh, through this definition here. So a choice function satisfies strong retentiveness or rho plus if for all feasible sets and all alternatives x. Um, or all alternatives x for which the dominators are non-empty, okay, so that means x is not a Condorcet winner, so there's something that dominates x. If we apply this choice function s only to the dominators of x, then the best dominators of x should also be the best elements of a. Okay, so the, the intuition here is just um, that if an alternative is among the best alternatives in a dominator set, it should also be among the best alternatives in the entire tournament. So why we are restricting attention to dominator sets is not exactly clear at this point. Once we look at the weaker condition, which is only called row, hopefully this is even more convincing. But at this point, it's just a condition that is saying that if some alternative is selected in any dominator, in some dominator set, then it also needs to be selected in from the entire tournament. Okay. Um, and so th the thing why we are excluding the empty set here is, of course, well, if we look at an alternative which is a Condorcet winner, well, then the dominator set would be empty, and then we would take, um, then we would apply S to the empty set, which is not really defined. So if if we define choice functions by saying that um, from the empty set we will choose the empty set, we, then we could omit this condition here. Okay, um, so by the way, so in case you were wondering why I'm now calling, talking about choice functions rather than social choice functions, so this condition, just like uh, beta plus and gamma, can be seen as a choice theoretic condition because it doesn't really argue about the preference profile. Okay, so we're only arguing about different feasible sets. So this may seem a bit confusing because here we, we look at the dominators, but then the dominators depend on the majority relation, so it seems like this does depend on the preferences of the voters in some way, but the dominators we can easily also define by only looking at pairwise choices. Okay, so the dominators of X are precisely those alternatives Y, which are chosen from the two element set X, Y. And if we do this for all two element sets, then we have a purely choice theoretic definition of the dominators. So that's, that's why this could be considered just a choice theoretic condition rather than social choice. Okay, so this is the intuitive definition. And then the first thing that we are going to show is that uh, rho plus is actually weaker than gamma. Okay, because b before we get to the characterization of the bank set, this is something we need to verify because um, otherwise it, um, well, it wouldn't really lie on this escape route where we are weakening expansion consistency conditions further and further. And in, in case you are not convinced that this is a good condition, then this can serve as an argument. So it's a weakening of gamma. So if you like gamma, it's only weaker than that. And also note that this implication here from gamma to rho plus only works for majoritarian function. I will tell you in a minute where we are using this in the proof, but for the previous implication from beta plus to gamma, 
This works for every function. Here we do need uh, this condition of majoritarianness. But we only need it for one case, in essentially, where we are saying that from a three cycle, all three alternatives are selected. Okay, so I did prepare this a bit to save some time. So we want to show that gamma and majoritarianness imply rho plus. And in order to do so, we uh, look at some choice function which satisfies majoritarianness and gamma. And we take some alternative, A. Um, and then we just, so this is really just restating the definition of rho plus, which was on the previous slide. We need to show that everything that is selected from the dominators of A is also selected from the entire tournament. Okay, so this is just writing down the definition of rho plus. And this has to hold for any A. So that's, that's why we pick A, so small A, we are picking arbitrarily. Um, okay, so maybe let me first draw a picture here. So we have this alternative A. And one thing that is always useful in tournaments, which we also exploited for the uncovered set, is that any tournament can be partitioned into three sets, singleton A and the dominion of A and the dominators of A. So this is the dominion of A. These are the dominators. Okay, and then we do know that um, Um, okay, oh, that's all. No, what we want to show now is that everything that is selected from the dominators is also selected from A. And in order to do this, we pick some alternative X, which is selected from the dominators of A. Okay, so we just pick something which is... Okay, now it becomes really tiny, but... This is S of the dominators of A. <laughs> and there's some X up here, okay? <laughs> and what we then want to show is that X is not only chosen from the dominators, but it's also chosen from the entire tournament. So this X, we only know, is chosen from this set here. And we want to show that X is also chosen from the entire tournament, okay? So that would be all that we have here. And the only property that we can actually use, or well, there's two properties, it's majoritarianness, but we, as I said, we only need it for one tiny step. But the important property that we can use is, is gamma. Okay, and if, if we want to show that this alternative X is chosen in this entire tournament, at this point, we only know that it's chosen from this set here. Well, then the idea is, as we have done uh, in the case of the uncovered set, is to somehow cover this entire tournament with little tournaments in which, in which X is chosen as well. Okay, so we know that X is chosen from here. Um, and then if we can find other sub-tournaments in, in, from which X is chosen, then we can use gamma repeatedly to show that X needs to be chosen from the entire tournament. So the idea is a bit similar to what we had for the uncovered set. And how can we do this? Maybe before I write down the formal proof, let me just show you the idea, because actually the idea is fairly simple. Um, so we do know that X is chosen from this tournament. Okay? And then what we are now going to do is we look at lots of three element tournaments, namely those consisting of X, A, and an arbitrary alternative Y down here. So that's why I say lots of, of three element tournaments. For every alternative Y that is down here in this set, we look at the three element tournament X, A, plus Y. Okay. And in these three element tournaments, X, A, Y, so what do we know about this tournament? Well, we do know that X dominates A, we know that A dominates Y, but what we don't know is whether Y dominates X or X dominates Y. But it doesn't really matter, right? Because if X dominates Y, well, then X would be the Condorcet winner in X, A, Y. Okay, and then we know, since we already have gamma, we know that um, X needs to be chosen from this three element set here, because, um, well, if it's chosen from XA and it's chosen from XY, it also needs to be chosen from XAY. So if X is a Condorcet winner in this three element tournament, X um, needs to be chosen by S. If, on the other hand, there's an edge from Y to X, then X, A, and Y form a three cycle. Okay, and that's where we need majoritarianness. So in any tournament that only has three alternatives, which form a three cycle, just by the def definition of majoritarianness, which includes neutrality, everything has to be symmetric. So we need to select X, A, and Y at the same time. So all three alternatives. 
And that means no matter which y we take down here, x is among the winners. Either as the, it, um, it, it could be, well, e okay, so we, d we don't even know whether it has to be the only winner if it is a Condorcet winner in x a y, because Condorcet consistency is not one of the axioms that we are using. But by using gamma, we know that it is definitely among the winners. So that means for each of these y's, we find a three element tournament in which x is selected. We know that X is selected from the tournament up here, and then we have covered the entire tournament with lots uh, of uh, tiny tournaments, three element tournaments, plus, plus this dominator sub-tournament, and therefore X needs to, s needs to be selected in, uh, selected in all the tournaments. Okay, so this is what I'm now writing down formally. So we look at any Y in the dominion of A. And then the argument is, or the claim is, that X needs to be selected in the three element tournament uh, AXY. And why is th this the case? So we could have uh, XAY with an upwards edge like here. Um, well, then all three alternatives need to s be selected because of majoritarianness. Or it could be the case that we have x, a, y with no upwards edge, then x would be the Condorcet winner in this three element tournament. And then we know from gamma already that x needs to be among the winners. Okay, so a Condorcet winner needs to be among the winners in a transitive tournament. So x is always selected here, x is always selected there. Now we combine. This, um, so we not only use gamma once, but we use it many times because there are many such alternatives y. Okay, so for every alternative y down there, we do exactly the same reasoning. And then as a conclusion, we get um, that x also needs to be selected from s of a. Okay. And that already proves the statement. Okay, so we wanted to show Okay, maybe let's highlight this in a different color. So we, had, we have shown that everything that is chosen from the dominators of A is also chosen from the entire tournament or the set of all alternatives, capital A. And the only place where we actually used um, majoritarianness was for this three cyclic tournament here. Okay, so here we do need majoritarianists to argue that X is among the winners. So, but that also means that um, if we could weaken this condition substantially by not requiring neutrality or everything else that comes with majoritarianists by only saying that if we have a three cycle, then all three alternatives need to, need to be selected. So this weaker condition would suffice for this implication. This is just a technical remark. Okay, but are there questions regarding this proof? Okay, great. Then um, let's go back to the slides. So we have now shown that gamma implies rho plus if we restrict attention to majoritarian social choice functions. Um, and then, of course, well, the next big thing that we need to show is that the bank set uh, is the finest majoritarian social choice function satisfying rho plus. So this is a characterization that is analogous to the ones that we had for the top cycle and the uncovered set. So now we have this even weaker expansion consistency condition, and we show that the bank set is the finest majoritarian function satisfying the given condition. So, yeah, I say let's, let's do this proof um, before the break, so it should really fit right in. Um, so the way these kinds of proofs work is similar to what we have seen before for, for these uh, other functions. Um, so I've emphasized this previously already. So th this, this uh, consists of two different steps. First, we need to show that every function that satisfies rho plus, and that is majoritarian, is a coarsening of the bank set. So that means it returns all the bank's winners, maybe some other alternatives. Um, and then the second step is the one down here. We, need, we, we then need to show that the bank set does actually satisfy rho plus and majoritarianness. Okay, so the fact that bank satisfies majoritarianness is straightforward. So this is trivial because if you look at the definition of the bank set, it only depends on the majority relation, right? We only needed to argue about transitive sub-tournaments of the, 
of the entire tournament uh, given by the majority relation. So I'm not going to show that the Banks set satisfies majoritarianness because by definition it only depends on the majority relation. Um, the important part for the second step here is to show that it satisfies rho plus. But in, in, in these proofs here, so if you re recall the proof for the uncovered set and also for the top cycle, the second step is usually simpler than the first one. And the more interesting step also is the first one where we show that any such function that returns, uh, th that satisfies rho plus, at least returns all the bank's winners. So that's the first thing that we want to show. Okay, and in order to show this, um, well, if we want to show an inclusion from one set to the other, we just take some alternative x, which is in the bank set. Okay, again, I'm not writing down quantifiers, so we, we take one, uh, an arbitrary tournament, um, and then the set A is the set of all vertices in this tournament. And then what we want to show is that this alternative x is also returned by this choice function S. And the only thing we know about this function is that it satisfies rho plus and majoritarianness. Okay, so the first thing that we can do here is we can essentially fill in the definition of the bank set. So what, what does it mean for X to be returned by the bank set? Well, this means that there's some set capital B, which is um, inclusion maximal. Okay, basically, I'm just repeating the definition here. Um, so the second parameter here is the set of all transitive sets of this given tournament. So we have an inclusion maximal transitive set of which X is the maximal element. And since we want to argue about the other elements of this set as well, um, and since it's a transitive set, we can clearly just give a simple ordering of the alternative. So X is on top, and then we have, I think it's called X, X1, X2, X3, and so on. So there are K elements in this set, and we are giving them names from, um, well, basically X0, which is X. Okay, so X is X0, and then we have X1, to xk, and the ordering is just defined such that xi is majority preferred to x i uh, to xj. For all i that are less than j, okay. So we just have x on top here, then x one, x two and so on until xk. Okay, so what I have depicted here on the left-hand side is just this transitive set B. Okay, so now let me write down a set. So I'm, I'm writing down the definition and then you tell me what, uh, what we can say about this set. So which elements are contained in the set. So we are now defining a set C, which is defined as the intersection of the dominators of all the xi's. <laughs> okay, so we have x1 uh, to xk, and now we take the intersection of all these dominator sets in the entire tournament. So, so we have uh, these k alternatives, which are in the set B, and then we can have other alternatives, of course, in the tournament. Um, which could also possibly be, so for instance, if you look at the dominators of xk, well, then clearly x0, x1, x2, and so on are contained in the dominators of xk. Um, uh, okay, no, but that was a bad example. So maybe let's look at the dominators of, of x, for instance, or x1. So let's look at the dominators of x1. So x would be uh, a dominator of x1, but there could also be other dominators of x1, okay, which are outside of the set B. But what can we say about this set here, C, which is defined at the, as the intersection of all the dominators of those alternatives x0 to xk. Um, you are saying that x is contained in the set? Okay. Yeah. It is x, right? Yeah, so is it, there's no other alternative than x in this set here. Okay, because um, the dominators of xk um, 
consists of x x, x1, x2, and so on, and the dominators of xk minus 1 contain the alternatives that are on top of, um, uh, on, of xk minus 1. So these could also potentially contain other alternatives which are not in the set B, but since they are taking the intersection of all these dominator sets, including xk here, you're absolutely right that this set contains only the single alternative x. Okay, so x is the only alternative that is at the intersection of all these dominator sets. And this is because this is an inclusion maximal transitive set which has x on top, because um, if there would be some other alternative contained in the set, well, um, then, um, then this would not be an inclusion maximal set because there would be another alternative which dominates all the alternatives here. Okay. Okay, so this is just a restatement of the fact that B is an inclusion maximal transitive set. And now comes the interesting part. Um, I really think it's a, it's a funny little proof here because now the only property that we are now using is rho plus, of course. And um, what we are now doing is we, what we want to show is that X is in S of A, okay? So we want to show that X is contained in the set. And rho plus means that the winners of, uh, the of any dominator set are also contained in the entire tournament. And in order to achieve this, we apply rho plus for the entire set of alternatives here. And we st first start with xk. Okay, if we just apply rho plus once, we can say that the dominator, the winners of the dominators of xk have to be contained in this set here. Okay, so this is just a straightforward application of rho plus. So the winners of the dominators of xk have to be contained in S of A. Okay. Um, and what we are doing now is that we are looking at this sub-tournament here, the dominators of xk. Okay, so the dominators of xk uh, only contain these alternatives here. And then we look at the lowest alternative in this chain that we have at this point, which would be xk minus 1. So we look at the dominators of xk minus 1 within this sub-tournament here. Okay, and this is how we are repeatedly applying um, rho plus. And then we know that the winners, so maybe let me first give you the argument and then write it down formally because this is where the entire magic lies. So we look at the dominators of xk minus 1 within the subtournament here. Well, and those dominators would be x, x1, x2 until xk minus 2. Okay, and then in this even smaller tournament, which contains one alternative less, we look at the dominators of xk minus 2. Okay, and those contain x1, x2, um, x of course, and x uh, until xk minus 3. And, and we keep filling in this chain here until in the end, we are just talking about what is chosen from the one element set X. <laughs> okay, because we are narrowing down the tournament we that we are studying further and further. So we don't know what S is choosing be because the only thing that we know about S is that it satisfies rho plus. But one thing we know for sure, if S is applied to a singleton tournament, it has to select the alternative because any choice function returns at least one alternative. So in the end, we will have to argue about what S chooses from the singleton tournament that only consists of X, and therefore the answer, of course, will be X. And that means that we get this long uh, like chain of uh, inclusions, um, where in the end we say that X has to be contained in S of A. Okay, so this is how this argument works. So here, I just write down one more of these steps because it can be a bit tedious to write them down. So here, we look at the dominators of xk and then within this sub-tournament we look at the dominators of xk minus 1 so we can just see this as taking the intersection of the dominators of xk and xk minus 1 okay so everything so we we are restricting attention to the dominators of xk and then we look at the dominators of xk minus 1 within this set here and that's why we can just take the intersection uh, okay, I need to close this here. Um, and then we repeat the same argument many times, well, k times. And then what we get in the end is exactly this set C here, right? Because here we looked at the intersection of all these dominator sets, and here we have only two dominator sets, but then we're adding um, the dominators of xk minus 2, xk minus 3, and so on. So in the end, we will have S of C. Okay, and now comes the easy part. C is just singleton x. 
And from the singleton x, of course, we are choosing x. Therefore, x um, is contained in S of A because we have this long chain of inequalities um, which shows that x, uh, the singleton set x is a subset of S of A. And this is precisely what we wanted to show. Okay, so let's write it down here. So therefore, x is an S of A. Okay, and all of this relied on the fact that the set B here, maybe let's write here, the, so what we are depicting here is the set B, um, is an inclusion maximal transitive set in which x is the maximal element. Okay, so transitivity was used when we, when we argued that C consists of exactly the alternative x. Okay, um, so that means that we have shown that if x is in the bank set, then x also uh, needs to be selected by this function s. Or in other words, we have shown that the bank set or the, yeah, the bank set uh, social choice function is a refinement of s um, whenever s satisfies rho plus. And since we eventually want to show that the bank set is the finest majoritarian social choice function satisfying rho plus, we still need to show that banks itself satisfies rho plus. Because it, could be, it would be possible that um, the banks alternatives have to be contained in the choice set of any function s that satisfies rho plus, but maybe banks itself doesn't even satisfy rho plus. So this is the second part of the proof, um, which I'm going to give you. It's, it's simpler than the first one, unless there are questions regarding the first half. Okay, now the second part, um, yeah, maybe, okay, so I, I wrote it down beforehand because it's a lot of tedious notation, but the, formally the argument, or no, not formally, intuitively the argument can be understood quite easily um, because, it, so we, what we want to show, so first majoritarianness is trivial, okay, so it only depends on the majority relation, that, that's clear, so this is given. What we need to show only is that Banks satisfies rho plus. And that means we want to show that if x is among the bank's winners in the dominators of A, then x is also a bank's winner in the entire tournament A. Okay, so this is what this is just the definition of rho plus applied to banks. And for this, it again is, is handy to write down that this tournament can be partitioned into A, its dominion, and its domina dominators. And now we do know that x is a, uh, among the bank's winners in the dominators of A. Okay, so that means within this subtournament here, there's a transitive subtournament in which x is a maximal element. Okay, so there's some tournament, so or some subset B here, where x is the maximal element. Okay, and the only thing that we need to show is that x is also a bank's winner in the entire tournament here. Okay, so in, in order to show that something is a bank's winner, we need to find a transitive subtournament which cannot be extended from above. Um, and the argument works as follows. So here we just take this set B, which is a transitive tournament, we add the single alternative A. Okay, it's just a Condorcet loser which is added at the bottom of this transitive tournament here. And um, if X would not be a Banks winner, then there must be some other alternative which dominates B and A, okay, which extends this transitive set. So that means there must be some alternative, Y, which dominates A, well, because... Um, in, in order to dominate this set B plus A, Y has to be in the dominators of A, so that's why Y has to be up here. And this alternative Y, or maybe let's use a different color for this because we're actually arguing about the non-existence of such an alternative. So X, uh, Y has to be in the dominators of A, and Y needs to dominate all the alternatives in B. Okay, and if, if there was such an alternative which dominates this set plus A, well then X was not in the bank set of this dominator set to begin with, because well then this transitive set could be extended by Y. 
Okay, so the idea of the proof, so it's, you, you can see it as a proof by contradiction, so where we say, so x is a, is a maximal element in this transitive set here, then we are extending it further, and now we assume for contradiction that x, so that this transitive set, so by this, maybe let, it, let me highlight it, so this plus this, so this, <laughs> okay. So this transitive set, so this orange set here, we, um, if this set um, can be extended by some alternative from above, then this alternative has to lie up here. It has to be in the do uh, dominators of A. Um, and then, of course, this smaller transitive set would also not be maximal in the dominators of A. Okay, so this is the intuitive argument, and then formally it just says that um, well, there has to be some set B, which is witness to the fact that X is a Banks winner in the dominators here. X is a maximal element, and um, this implies that there can be no alternative Y um, which dominates B plus A, because, well, this is a maximal transitive set, and therefore the orange set is also a maximal transitive set, and that means that X is among the Banks winners of the entire tournament. So the only trick in this argument here is just to add this one more alternative um, to get the desired statement. So what we have shown now is um, if X is a Banks winner of the dominators of A, um, then X is also um, a Banks winner of the entire tournament. And both of these steps taken together prove um, that the bank set is the finest majoritarian social choice function satisfying a row plus. Questions? Okay. Um, then th these were the two main proofs that we were doing for today's lecture. So it's, I don't know, maybe some people are looking forward to the proofs, so now becomes the sad part, no more proofs. Maybe some of you are happy when we are done with the proofs. Um, let me show you some implications of this. Um, so since uh, we know that well, beta plus implies gamma, and gamma for majoritarian functions implies rho plus, so that was our first proof here, this also proves that we have this hierarchy here. So each of these functions was defined as the finest function satisfying the given axiom. TC, it was beta plus. UC, it was gamma. Banks, it was rho plus. So therefore, we have this um, hierarchy. Banks is contained in UC. UC is contained in the top cycle. Um, this also implies that the bank set satisfies Pareto optimality. Um, just because, well, if the bank set is contained in the uncovered set and the uncovered set already never contains Pareto-dominated alternatives, well, then a subset of the uncovered set, of course, also doesn't contain Pareto-dominated alternatives. Um, okay, so I think that's a perfect time for a break because then after the break, we will think about the question whether we can find uh, elements in the bank set quickly. And the interesting thing is, so there are two different answers to this question, which seem like contradicting each other, but both of them are correct. So let's have a break until 5.35. Uh, Maybe some of you already thought about uh, what we could do about the computation of the bank set. Um, does any, any of you have an immediate idea of how we can find an element in the bank set? Or maybe find an argument why an alternative is not contained in the bank set? So before the break, we looked at these two examples. Um, and basically what we did there is just we looked at transitive sub-tournaments and, and checked whether X is a maximal element of these and whether it can be extended from above or not. Um, any ideas? Yes? Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so uh, so uh, okay, so let's let's as you say, let's start with an arbitrary node or vertex, um, and then check whether it's whether there's some other vertex that dominates the given vertex, right? So then we have already found a transitive set of size two, and then we can check whether there's some other alternative which dominates those two that we already have. I, I guess that is the idea that you had, right? And then we keep on looking for such alternatives. Um, maybe let me draw it here. So we start with an arbitrary alternative, then we just 
check whether there's something that dominates this one. Okay, if the answer is yes, then we take it. If we find something else which dominates the previous two, then we take it as well. Maybe there's another one that dominates everything we had so far. And maybe at that point we are running out of alternatives that dominate everything in the current working set. Okay, so as you said, this is a polynomial time algorithm um, which finds an alternative in the bank set. Right, so the important thing, that's why I'm emphasizing it here, is that we started with an arbitrary alternative, we, we ran this algorithm, and then we know that the last element that we added is an alternative in the bank set. Okay, so in polynomial time, we can find an alternative that is contained in the bank set. However, um, this algorithm doesn't seem to help for the question of um, whether, say, this alternative is contained in the bank set. If you want to know whether this alternative in the, is in the bank set, it's not exactly clear how we could answer that question, right? Because the algorithm that we just sketch, sketches starts, uh, starts with some alternative. We could also start with this one here, but of course that would not be a very good start because then we keep adding alternatives to dominate that one, so it's clearly then uh, immediately dismissed as a bank's winner once we add another alternative. Um, and that's why I said before the break that there are two answers to the question of whether we can compute the bank set efficiently or not. So what we have seen at this point is an efficient algorithm for finding an alternative in the bank set. Um, the problem of deciding whether a given alternative is contained in the bank set is of a different nature. And we will actually show that this problem is NP-complete. So the question of whether a given alternative is in the bank set is a difficult problem. Finding something in the bank set is easy. Okay, so, it's, um, so there have been two papers about this, this problem. So first it was shown that the decision problem is NP-complete, and then there was a follow-up paper by another author, Olivier Houdry, who pointed out that the, despite the difficulty of the decision problem, it's easy to find arbitrary alternatives that are contained in the bank set. But uh, the first thing to, to understand is that these are two different problems, and one of them can be easy, whereas the other one can be hard. Okay, so... Um, random alternatives, so I, I call it, so it's not really like randomization in a probabilistic sense, but finding an arbitrary alternative in the bank set can be done efficiently, exactly uh, as we discussed here. Or more formally, we, can s we say that we construct a maximal transitive set by iteratively adding alternatives from the intersection of dominator sets. Okay, um, or in other words, what we did is we were looking for more alternatives that dominate everything in the current working set. So this way, we are constructing a chain, a transitive sub-tournament of the given tournament, which cannot be extended anymore. Um, so in, in case you prefer pseudocode, so this is a one way to write this down. So we have a current working set which is empty in the beginning. We start with some alternative A, put A in the working set, and then we look at some alternative which lies at this intersection here, and writing down this intersection is just a fancy way of saying that we are looking for alternatives that dominate everything in B. Okay, so because all the alternatives that lie at the intersection of all these dominator sets are alternatives that dominate everything in the set capital B. If we can find no more such alternatives, then the last alternative that we added, that would be A, um, is a Banks winner, and otherwise, um, Uh, why do we put A in C here? Uh, I don't see at this point what this line is for. <laughs> Does anybody else see it? Or <laughs> so if, if no more alternatives... Pardon me? Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Okay, so we, yes, <laughs> great answer. So uh, sometimes you're really stuck uh, with the easiest things here. So it's, of course, okay, so A, the, that was the alternative that we started with, and now we are inside this loop here, and we have to find some other alternative A, um, which is a, uh, an alternative that needs to be added to the current working set. Okay, and, and that would be any element of the set C does the job. And then we take the, this A here, and then we are in this loop. Okay, so it's, it's a relatively simple algorithm and also runs in, in linear time um, if implemented properly. So this is uh, nice and easy, but as already revealed, um, computing the bank set is NP-hard. Okay, so I 
before I, I talked about the decision problem, deciding whether an alternative is contained in the bank set, but if the decision problem uh, is, is NP-hard, and that is what we are going to see in a minute, then also computing the entire bank set is NP, has to be NP-hard. So again, this is the distinction between search and decision problem. So this is a search problem, find the bank set of a tournament, but if you already know that the decision problem, deciding whether a given alternative X is contained in the bank set, whether if this problem is already hard, then this search problem has to be hard as well, because if we had an oracle that gave us the bank set for free, then of course we could easily answer all these decision queries by, by just asking our oracle, so what's the bank set? And then we just check, okay, X is in there, and then the answer is yes, otherwise it's no. Um, so therefore, because uh, it has immediate consequences for the search problem, um, we usually look at the decision problem of deciding whether a given alternative is contained um, in the choice set. And uh, this hardness proof here was first done by Gerhard Wöginger, a uh, well-known theoretical computer scientist uh, who contributed to many different areas. Um, he unfortunately passed away just last year. And he has also worked uh, in, in recent years in computational social choice. And he proved um, that this decision problem is NP-complete by reducing from the problem of three colorability. Maybe some of you have heard about this problem. It's one of the classic NP-complete problems. The proof that I'm going to show you is different. It's, uh, so I'm actually showing you a hardness proof. So I did say no more proofs, but there is a proof, but it's on the slide. So it's a very, very simple reduction proof. So no more proofs that I'm writing down. Um, and this proof is different than the one that I'm showing you because it's a reduction from satisfiability. So the most uh, well-known NP-complete uh, problem. And interestingly, so I, I think the proof is much easier than the original one by, by Wöginger, um, and that's why it also fits on this single slide. Um, before I show you the proof, so this uh, statement also holds if we restrict the number of uh, voters. So it's in, in general, once we argue about majoritarian functions, we are implicitly always making use of the McGarvey theorem or maybe some more efficient variant of it, but we know that every tournament can be obtained by some preference profile. And that means that in our, uh, in, at the back of our mind, we should always know that the number of voters basically is unbounded, because well, with the constant number of voters, we cannot get all the tournaments. So this is also related to the Christmas challenge, which I will talk about at the end of the lecture. Um, nevertheless, we can still show uh, that the hardness result like this also works for a low constant number of voters, because for, this, for these hardness constructions, maybe not every tournament is required. So usually, in order to prove hardness like this, you take here, this is a proof uh, reduction from satisfiability. You take a formula and propositional logic, and then you transfer or tr translate this formula into a tournament. Um, and then for this tournament, you have that a certain vertex is contained in the bank set if and only if the formula, the original formula, was satisfiable. Um, but maybe this translation process doesn't need all tournaments. So this is basically always the case because we only need a subset of tournaments that are used in the actual hardness construction. And what we did in, in this paper here, so I think this is a paper I cited already before, so some, some of these co-authors are former students um, from this course here, previous iterations of this course, there we showed that all the tournaments that are required for this proof can be constructed using only five voters, and therefore the hardness also holds for only five voters. Whether it also holds for three, I think, is open, so we weren't able to show this. Okay, so here the entire proof sketch pops up immediately. Um, so it's a reduction from CNF sats. So this is, uh, CNF means conjunctive normal form. So the terms that I'm using when I'm talking about this slide hopefully are familiar to you from previous lectures like discrete structures, for instance, uh, where you were also talking about propositional logic. Um, so CNF sat just means that you have a formula like this formula phi here and propositional logic. So we have, for instance, in this formula, we have uh, P, Q, S, R, we have four variables which can either be true or false. Um, then this formula can use ends and, and nots and ors. Um, and conjunctive normal form means that we have these so-called clauses. So this is a clause where different um, variables or negations of the variables are combined using ors. And um, between these clauses, we have ends. And the question for this satisfiability problem is, is whether there is an assignment of these variables, of these four variables, to true and false for each of these variables, such that, such that the formula is true. Okay, so that's basically the canonical NP-complete problem. So it's, in general, it's, it's difficult or NP-complete to decide whether a large formula of this type 
um, is satisfiable or not. And then for this reduction here, we take such a formula and then we translate it to a tournament. This is, so I'm, it's, it's not really full proof here, so that's why I'm saying proof sketch here. Um, but I think the, 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 sketch, the sketch is sufficient to get the entire idea of the proof. So once you have understood the sketch, you can write down the proof. Um, we are taking this example of the formula phi here. Then we construct a tournament using a, a, special, a special method that I'm describing in a minute. And then um, the relationship between the formula and the tournament is as follows. So this formula is satisfiable if and only if this vertex here, so with this vertex D, is a bank's winner of this tournament. Okay, so then, then the only thing that uh, we need to verify is that this translation from the formula to the tournament is a polynomial time reduction. So everything that we do by going from here to here has to be possible in polynomial time. That's easily the case. And then we have basically shown the computational equivalence of these problems. Deciding whether this is a bank's winner or whether this formula is satisfiable are computationally equivalent problems. Okay, so now let's, let's see how this translation works. So this is an example formula. What we do here is we restrict attention, um, f at least for the example of, uh, of clauses that only have three literals. So a literal, so hopefully it rings a bell, is, is e either a variable or the negation of a variable. So these three parts um, here, not P, S and Q, these are all literals. And P, S, and R are also literals, and P, Q, and not R are also literals. So in each of these clauses, we have three literals. So we are basically already doing the reduction from three satisfiability, in case you have heard that before. But the same proof also works if, if clauses are larger. So we are not really exploiting the fact that we have exactly three literals here. And then and in, this, in these tournaments that we are constructing here, a large part of this is just like... Um, like, like a skeleton that is built around it, which is, doesn't even depend on the formula. So, so these vertices will always be here. The decision node D will also be here. And the interesting part just happens for all these vertices here, which correspond to the literals of the different clauses. So here you can already see that we have not P, S, Q here, and therefore we also have corresponding vertices, not P, S, Q in here. Um, the second clause is translated to P, S, R here, another clause and the last one, PQ and not R here, PQ not R. So we just put them in an arbitrary order. So notice that this is going from top to bottom here. We are again omitting edges from top to bottom. The ordering doesn't matter. Um, so that means each clause is translated to one of these, uh, you could call these components in this tournament graph. So I'm not sure whether you have seen this notation maybe in the tutorials. So what this gray box or this gray ellipse with this arrow here means that all three of these alternatives dominate C1. Okay, so and all three of these vertices dominate C3. And the same here. And otherwise, all edges are going from top to bottom, as always. Okay, so for each of these clauses, we have one of these components. And then the only thing that we need to add is just edges from one um, variable to its negated variable. So whenever um, uh, some variable, let's say P here, appears on top of this variable here in a negated form, we have to have an edge from the former to the latter. Okay, so if we have, since we have not P on top of P here, so from both of these P's, we have edges going upwards from P to not P. So if, if there would be another clause down here where there's another not P, there would be edges from this not P to P, for instance. So if there's something on top, which is the negated version of the literal, then we have these upward edges. So the only case for this example here, where we have upward edges are from P to not P here, and here we have not R and R. So, well, of course, not, not R is R, so therefore we have an edge going from here to here. Okay, so it, first thing to understand is just, so now for any other propositional formula that is in conjunctive normal form like this one here, we could construct a tournament like this one here. Okay, so for each of these clauses, we have a component, and then we just add these upward edges between variables and their negated versions. Okay? So, and, and clearly this can be done in polynomial time. So, for, so this is an example for this formula here, but any other formula phi, we could do the very same construction. And then for each of these uh, components here, we have an alternative up here, as you can see. So this is like what I call the skeleton, which is fixed. So for each clause, we have an alternative up there, which dominates everything except the clause, because we have an upward edge going there. Um, and then, um, we only need to convince ourselves that D is in the bank set if and only if phi is satisfiable, because that is the claim. So this is how this tournament 
and the bank set are related to this formula. And in order to see this, we basically just need to understand these two statements here. So this is the important part of this proof. Um, the first one is, um, since we are interested in whether D is a Banks winner, the first claim here is a maximal transitive set with maximal element D, so some witness to the fact that D is in the bank set, has to contain s at least one element of every level below D. And by levels, I mean these different, so this is a level, this is a level, this is a level, and so on. Okay, and the claim is that a maximal transitive set which has maximal element D has to contain at least one element from each of these levels. And why is this the case? So let's just assume, for instance, that we don't have, so we have a maximal transitive subtournament with maximal element D, but none of these three alternatives is contained in this transitive subtournament. Why would that be a contradiction? If we, for instance, take D, U2, let's say P, U4, and this other P node here. Yes? Okay, so we, we could also add S, of Q, uh, S or Q, and then it would still be transitive. Um, that's right, but um, it wouldn't matter that much because it wouldn't have uh, the, this new transitive set wouldn't have a different maximal element. So again, I'm switching between these two different uh, definitions of the bank set, but you're of course right. But the problem is that we can add another alternative if we only have D, U2, P, U4, and P, um, which then leads to a different maximal element. Yes? Yes. Right, so if we add C1, um, and we don't have anything from this set here, then C1 dominates D. Well, C1 dominates everything, uh, including D, except for this component here. And if we don't have anything from this component, we are not protected from being um, dominated by C1. So it's like, in, in order to have D as a maximal element, we need as a protection at least one element from each of these levels. Once we don't have a protection from any of these from any of these levels, then one of these guys is going to kill us uh, because they are dominating um, this uh, transitive set. So this is the first statement here. Okay, so from, from every level we need something if D is the maximal element. Oops. No. Okay. Um, and, then, and then the second part is that a maximal transitive set with maximal element D cannot contain upward edges. Okay, and by upward edges, I mean precisely those edges here that uh, are going from bottom to top. So in, in this example, we have only three of these upward edges that go from one literal to the negated literal. Um, and so because we know already, so if D is in the bank set, we need to take at least one alternative from each of these levels, in particular U2, U4, U6, and so on, they are always contained in the maximal transitive set of which D is a maximal element and at least one of each of these gray circles. Now the second claim is that we cannot have a transitive set which contains, for instance, not P and P, because then there would be an upward edge. And why is that the case? So if we have, for instance, not P, P, and one alternative from each of these levels, why would, there be, why would that not be transitive anymore? Yes? Exactly, right? So if we have a literal and it's negated version, then we have a three cycle, right? Because U2, as I said, and U4, and U6, and U8, and so on, they're always contained in this transitive set. So this construction prevents us from having a variable and its negated version in the transitive set. And this is exactly what we want. So I think here you can also see how this construction was developed because, of course, we want to set variables to either true or false, but not to true and false at the same time. And the idea is that something is in this transitive set if and only if the corresponding literal is set to true. Okay, so here we have to make a decision. Either we set not P to true, which means that P is false, um, or we set P to true, um, but we cannot do both at the same time because otherwise there's a three cycle and then D is definitely not in the bank set, at least not for this transitive set that we were talking about. Um, and that already completes the proof, because now uh, the statement here, this equivalence, is pretty much straightforward, because if D is in the bank set, so it's, it's, it's going in both directions, um, if D is in the bank set, then we can find an inclusion maximal transitive set in which D is the maximal element, and we know from this here, there's one, is, uh, one vertex from each level is contained in here. 
Um, we cannot have two vertices which have an upward edge, so we cannot set a variable to true and false at the same time. Um, and therefore, the translation from this transitive set in which D is a maximal element to the satisfying assignment of the formula is just that we all the alternatives that are contained here, so let's say, for instance, here we take, I don't know, not P, S, and Q, for instance, that means that not P is set to true, so P is set to false, and S is set to true, and Q is set to true, and there's a direct correspondence between satisfying assignments of the formula and these transitive subturnaments that are witness to the fact that D is contained in the bank set. And that's already makes clear why this uh, implication goes both ways, because we can also do it the other way around. So if we have a satisfying assignment, we can, for instance, say, I don't know, we take, we can also, of course, set more than one variable, uh, one, more than one literal true in each of these components or clauses. So we can, for instance, set S to true and Q to true. Um, then this one is already in here as well. And um, maybe um, P as well. Okay, so then this transitive set D, this S, Q, this other S, and this P here, um, and of course U2 and U4 correspond to a transitive set in which D is a maximal element, and then the satisfying assignment that we get is just, uh, or that we started with is actually S, Q, S, and P here. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the satisfying assignments and what we need to construct in order to get this witness to the fact that D is a Banks winner. Um, and yeah, as I said, so I think this construction is much simpler than the original one here, which is, this is an entire paper just devoted to the hardness construction. Um, and basically how, how we ended up with this thing here is that I um, wanted to understand this proof, but it was so complicated that I never finished reading it. And then I just tried to prove the statement separately using a different construction. I was wondering in the beginning already, why isn't he using satisfiability rather than three colorability? And in that case, um, um, I guess, yeah, it, it seems like he just missed the fact that this uh, is a bit simpler, this construction. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so that, that gives us um, like uh, a negative result for the bank set. So computing banks winners is, is difficult. We, we can find something in the bank set. So, it, so that means like if you have an exercise, for instance, where we give you a large tournament and the question is find something in the bank set, then you can easily do this using this even linear time algorithm. If the question is, we give you a large tournament and is vertex X contained in the bank set? Mm, okay, so for th this problem is now known to be NP complete. So that means for larger tournaments, um, um, you might have a hard time because no polynomial time algorithm is known for this problem. Okay, so so much on the computational properties of the bank set. Um, now some additional facts. Um, so I think this is something that we basically have already seen. So um, the bank set contains a singleton if there's a Condorcet winner. Okay, so the other direction we haven't seen. So this is an if and only if statement. So this is even stronger than Condorcet consistency because this statement here says that if there's a Condorcet winner, um, then this Condorcet winner will be selected uniquely. But it also says that if some alternative will be selected uniquely, then it has to be the Condorcet winner. Um, but uh, this is basically, so the new direction is from, from left to right, but that's basically straightforward because if you think about the example before the break where we had a Condorcet winner, well then every transitive set is eventually extended by the Condorcet winner. Okay. Um, and, um, right, so th that's why we have the implication here. So this is, as I said, even a bit stronger than Condorcet consistency. And it also implies that singleton, uh, uh, it obviously implies that singletons are only selected if they are Condorcet winners. Um, and this is the case for some majoritarian functions, but not all. So for instance, for Copeland's rule, uh, which perhaps is the simplest majoritarian, majoritarian function you can think of, it's also possible to select single winners in the absence of Condorcet winners, right? So you only need to have a single vertex which has the highest degree. Um, but for the bank set, a singleton will only be selected if it's a Condorcet winner. And the same thing also holds for UC and TC because of these known inclusions. Um, so one, one of these, uh, again, so by the same property, I mean this if and only if statement here. So these directions here refer to this if and only if, the direction from left to right here follows from the known inclusion. So if, if um, if Banks selects a single alternative, then clearly UC and TC also need to select a single. I uh, know it's 
Mm. It's the other way around. So it's if, if TC already selects a single alternative, then Banks also has to select a single alternative. Or if UC selects a single alternative, since Banks is a subset, Banks also selects a single alternative. But for all three of these majoritarian solution concepts, it's the case that singletons are only selected if and only if um, there is a Condorcet winner. Um, right, so that uh, is basically what we are going to say about the bank set. Um, on the upcoming exercise sheet, of course, there will be some, some exercises related to the bank set. For instance, one question that we left open here is whether it satisfies monotonicity, which is a property that should be satisfied. Um, well, we have seen some functions don't, but uh, as an exercise, for instance, you are going to show that the bank set does satisfy monotonicity. Um, but strong retentiveness uh, wouldn't be called strong retentiveness if there was another weakening of it, which we just call retentiveness. And this condition looks as follows. Um, so it may look more complicated than it is because it's exactly the same definition as for strong retentiveness, except for the red part here. So if you recall, strong retentiveness was defined by saying that um, the best alternatives from each dominator set have to be selected from the entire tournament. And here we are not looking at every dominator set, but only the dominator sets of the alternatives that are chosen. Okay, so the, the difference was just that for strong retentiveness, we had X element A here. That is the only difference. And now we are making this condition weaker by saying that we only impose this condition on alternatives X, which are chosen by this uh, function S. Okay, so therefore, just logically, this is a weaker condition because uh, we only imply it, um, uh, we, we only uh, enforce it for a subset of the alternatives X here. Um, and that will lead us to the uh, like uh, final majoritarian functions, at least of, of today's lecture, which is called the tournament equilibrium set. So we are weakening rho plus even further to rho. Um, and doing this, discuss the so-called tournament equilibrium set. So maybe some, so the tournament equilibrium set, which we are discussing in the remaining time of, of today's lecture is, is uh, really um, mm, a very interesting, but at the same time also mind-boggling mind -boggling, uh, majoritarian function. So once you see the definition, you will be really surprised that this is actually a correct definition, but it is. Um, and the main reason why I'm introducing this, this concept is because th some very interesting lectures can be learned about uh, like theoretical research in general when discussing the tournament equilibrium set. So even if you are never going to work with the tournament equilibrium set in the future, and I guess many of you won't, um, probably almost all of you won't, there are some, some interesting things to learn about from the tournament, or at least the story of the tournament equilibrium set. So this uh, social choice function was introduced by Thomas Schwartz, a political scientist, um, in the 90s, I think, 1990, I believe. Um, and it, again, it's based on an auxiliary notion, like we had the covering relation, dominant sets, and transitive sets for the bank set. Um, for the tournament equilibrium set, we need the notion of an S retentive set. Okay, and this definition works as follows. So we say th this is just a property of a set of alternatives. So it's not a definition of a social choice function at this point. So we say that a set of alternatives B, like in the example here, is S retentive for some choice function S. Okay, so S is just a function that given the tournament returns some subset of alternatives. So you can think of S as triff if you want. So the trivial function that always returns everything, or it could be the top cycle or Copeland. You can just fit in uh, or fill in arbitrary functions at this point. And then a set is um, called S retentive if you apply S to the dominators of X for any alternative X in the set. Okay, so that's why you see how it's related to this row condition. So we take an alternative that is contained in B, such as X, for instance. We look at the dominators of X, some of which may, may lie inside of B and some of which may, may be outside of B. And then the condition is just that the best alternatives of the dominators have to be contained in B. Okay, so and, and um, if you think about this for a while, this is like a very intuitive and natural condition because the problem in general is if you pick a set of alternatives, ideally we want to pick a set of alternatives which is not dominated by anything. That would be a Condorcet winner. But in many cases, there are no Condorcet winners. So we pick a set of alternatives which are dominated, unfortunately, um, by some other alternatives, 
But here the argument is that if you only look at the best of those alternatives, so this is the choice set from the dominator set here, those are already contained in the set B. Okay, so there are alternatives that dominate X, but the best of these are already chosen by this, uh, by this function S here. So therefore there's nothing to worry about because this set in, the, in this sense is, is stable, so retentiveness is like another word for stability. This set is stable because um, the best alternatives that dominate X are already contained in this set B here. Okay, so re S retentiveness would be violated if from the set of dominators here we would choose some alternative up here. So then S retentiveness of the set B would be violated. So you can also think of this as a subrelation of the dominance relation, which uh, sometimes in papers is called like proper dominance. So X is dominated by many alternatives, everything in this set here, but it's only properly dominated by the best of the dominators. And if it's only properly dominated by alternatives that are already in B, then it's fine. Then the set is good. Um, if it's properly dominated by some, something outside of B, then this is bad. Okay, so in this way you can define a subrelation of the dominance relation by saying that X is properly dominated if there's some um, alternative selected, <coughs> is, is it properly dominated by all alternatives that are selected from the dominators of X. Okay, so this is the definition of S retentiveness. Um, it's hopefully clear, right? So we just say that according to some choice function S, a set is S retentive or not. Um, so for instance, e easy things we can already verify is that um, the set of all alternatives, for instance, trivially is S retentive. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like dominant sets that we know from the top cycle. So the set of all alternatives is S retentive because um, the best elements from the dominators of X are always contained in the set of all alternatives. So therefore it makes sense to look at small S retentive sets, just like in the case of dominant sets for the top cycle. Okay, so this is what I already said. Um, so one thing that is also clear at this point is that, that for instance, if you have a Condorcet winner, um, then the singleton set that only consists of the Condorcet winner is an S retentive set no matter what S is. Right, so no matter how the underlying uh, choice function S is defined, um, since we only look at alternatives X and B for which the set of dominators is non-empty. Um, so the set X is clearly not properly dominated by anything because it is not properly uh, it is not even dominated by something. Okay, so the, this proper dominance relation is, is a sub-relation um, of the dominance relation. So if you have a Condorcet winner, then the singleton X is an S retentive set. Um, but of course, so the interesting question that remains is, is which S do we take? So this is just a methodology for um, like defining which sets are stable. Um, and well, no matter what S we take, the first thing that we need to clarify is which sets of alternatives do we want to return. So since the set of all alternatives is always S retentive, it seems to make sense, just like in the case of the top cycle, to look at inclusion minimal sets that are S retentive. So therefore, um, we can define a new choice function, which here is called S ring. Okay, so there's a little ring here on top of S which returns all inclusion minimal S retentive sets. Okay, so we don't, there could be more than one inclusion minimal. Um, and that defines a new social choice function. So the, the thing to understand at this point is just, so this methodology allows us to take an arbitrary social choice function, such as, say, Copeland, for instance. Um, um, and then we can define Copeland ring, and that's a well-defined social choice function. Okay, so it's the set, um, uh, it's the social choice function that returns all the minimal Copeland retentive sets. That means sets such that for all alternatives in the set, if we look at the dominators, the Copeland winners of the dominators have to be contained in the set that we are looking at. Okay, and then we are looking at all the smallest sets that satisfy the stability property. So I'm just saying that this is a well-defined definition. So I think in one paper this thing has been studied. Um, it's, it's one thing that you can do, right? So you can also look at UC ring, for instance, or Banks ring, just to, to give you an idea. So this is not really a, a single definition of a social choice function, but a general methodology how we can define new social choice function by taking old ones. 
Um, and in some cases, it turns out that this ring thing is actually strictly contained um, or is contained in the original, in whatever the original social choice function returns, which is quite nice. Um, maybe one example, I think we do have enough time for this, just to give you more of an intuition. The, tri the most trivial uh, variant of this ring social choice function would be TRIF ring, right? So I think TRIF you have seen before, right? TRIF is the social choice function that always returns everything. So in case you haven't, I'm now defining it. Um, TRIF always returns all alternatives. Now, what would TRIF ring be? Okay, so TRIF ring means that here S would be TRIF. So we can just ignore S then here. So it just means that the dominators of X have to be contained in B, right? So because if S always returns everything, because it's the trivial function, this condition just boils down to saying that for every alternative in the set that is returned, all, the, all its dominators are also contained in the set. So the reason why I'm asking this is because this is a social choice function you already know. So it's equivalent to a function you are aware of already. <laughs> Okay, because since here we are, so the gray area then here would be everything from the dominator set. So that means all these alternatives in the set B are not dominated by something from the outside. But yes, it's the top cycle, right? So it's, that implies that if, if, if this is the smallest set of alternatives, which is not dominated by something, it means it dominates everything. We are talking about tournaments here. So Trev Ring is the top cycle. Okay. Um, okay, but now comes the interesting part. So maybe this is already a bit confusing uh, to some of you, but now comes the, like, the mind-boggling bo and uh, perhaps ingenious part, so how Schwartz actually defined the tournament equilibrium set, because this, there's an infinite number of possibilities how to define a new social choice function, and what Sch Schwartz did, okay, so this is fairly obvious, is the following. So he said, um, the tournament equilibrium set TEQ is defined by declaring that TEQ equals TEQ ring. And that's it. That's the entire definition. So there's no nothing missing. So it's, I think it's a pretty good example of something that you can write down in a very small amount of space, but still, I think basically all of you will take, um, will need more time to completely understand how this tournament equilibrium thing is, is actually defined and even to compute it on example tournaments. But this is the complete definition. So why does this work? So I think the best way is to think about this as a recursive definition, because in order to check whether some set is S retentive, we need to compute S for the dominator sets of all the alternatives in the set. Okay, but the dominator sets are always strictly smaller than the original tournament because the dominators of X never contain X. So this is a smaller tournament that we are looking at. So each dominator set is strictly smaller than the set of all alternatives. And then within this dominator set, we need to check whether some set is, is uh, S retentive. And there we also need to look at the dominators within this dominator set. Okay, and if we look at the dominators within the dominator set, we are again looking at smaller tournaments. So therefore, we look at dominators of dominators of dominators, smaller and smaller tournaments, and in the end, just like uh, in the proof that I showed you before the break uh, about the bank set, we will eventually end up in a singleton tournament, and there it's clear what S does, so we don't know anything. So here, that basically leaves S completely open, except for this recursive definition, but the beginning of the recursion is well defined. From a singleton tournament, we need to select the single alternative that is contained in the tournament. Um, so the nice thing is, is it, it, looks, it also looks like a fixed point, right? So because this is a, this ring operator, and basically we are saying that according to this ring operator, this uh, social choice function is defined using this fixed point formula here, but essentially it's just a recursive definition. So uh, you can think of it as the unique fixed point of the ring operator, but well, this is just uh, doesn't give you anything in, in order to, to help argue about the tournament equilibrium set. Um, okay, so this, this is a well-defined definition and therefore you can, you can prove theorems about the tournament equilibrium set. And one of the first things that uh, Schwartz proved in, in his paper is that this is a refinement of the bank set, which is pretty nice. So we've just talked about the bank set, which is a refinement of UC, which is a refinement of TC. So it's further down in this hierarchy of majoritarian functions. Um, and um, this is pretty difficult to prove. 
Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's an exercise, it's a star exercise, and we give you a hint on how to prove this, but um, if, if you have trouble, uh, don't despair. So this is probably an exercise that is a bit harder than some of the other star exercises. Um, but of course, it's a very nice and, and useful statement to know that this is contained in the bank set. Um, maybe uh, one other thing regarding the definition here. So one thing that at least I would find a bit ugly about the definition is, is that uh, in general for S-ring, we take the union of all these inclusion minimal S-retentive sets. It would be much nicer if we could show in general that there's always a unique minimal S-retentive set and only take this one. Just like in the case of the top cycle, we had the definition of dominant sets and then we proved that they are contained in each other and then we, there was always a unique inclusion minimal um, dominant set. And um, this is something that Schwartz already conjectured, that for, that for TEQ, every tournament admits a unique inclusion minimal TEQ retentive set. And this is a conjecture that has been open for quite a while, and I'm mainly talking about this conjecture in the following um, couple of minutes. Okay, so but here's, here's an example um, to see how you can really because just based on this definition, TEQ equals TEQ ring, you, it's a well-defined concept, you can really def uh, compute TEQ. Um, so here's an example tournament <coughs> consisting of, of five vertices. And here we are actually depicting this proper dominance relation. So these are the thick edges here. And what do I mean by proper dominance? So maybe let's draw this here. So I'm saying that... Um, y properly dominates x if y is in the TQ of the dominators of x. Okay, so we look at x, we look at the dominators of x, and uh, I don't know, let's maybe just use the blue color for TEQ of the dominators, and if y is in here, then y properly dominates x. Okay, then we have a thick edge in, in here. Now, uh, Computing TEQ even in this simple example is quite tedious, so that's why I'm already revealing what TEQ is. So in this example, it turns out ABC is the tournament equilibrium set. Um, even without checking how these thick edges are being computed, you can verify that this is the case because um, here ABC forms a TEQ retentive set. So the set ABC is not properly dominated. That means it has no ingoing thick edge. Okay, so as you can see here, so this is like a maximal component here. There's no thick edge that is pointing towards anything in ABC. Whereas, for instance, let's say um, the set DE, for instance, is, is uh, clearly not TEQ retentive because it has lots of these ingoing thick edges here. And now the interesting part is how we actually compute these thick edges. So in order to... Uh, compute whether which alternatives properly dominate A. We need to look at the dominators of A. For A, it's simple enough because A only has one dominator, that's C. Okay, and then we need to compute TEQ of this smaller tournament C. Okay, so there's, there's a singleton tournament, so therefore TEQ of the singleton is just C. So this is where the recursion just starts, so we know that C is in the TEQ here, so therefore we have this uh, thick edge from C to A because um, C is in the TEQ of the dominators of A. Now, we, can, we have to do the same thing for the other alternatives. For alternative B, we need to look at the dominators. So here, there's two alternatives that dominate B, A and E. Okay, so that means we look at this two uh, alternative sub-tournament here, and we need to check what TEQ of this two-element tournament is. <laughs> Okay, so here, by doing another step in this recursion, we can realize that this is the unique inclusion minimal T retentive set because, well, it's just a Condorcet winner. Um, so nothing is, is dominating this alternative, and there is no other um, um, TQ or inclusion minimal T retentive set. So, for instance, this singleton set here um, would not be T retentive <coughs> because this alternative is properly dominated by that one here. Okay, and we can use this argument over and over again whenever we encounter a dominator set which only consists of two alternatives, then only the better of the two alternatives is dominating the alternative that we were looking at. So here we were looking at B, A and E are dominators of, of B, but only A properly dominates B. So therefore we have a thick edge from A to B, but not a thick edge from, B to, uh, from E to B. 
Okay, and then we can do the same thing for C. It's again dominator size two, so it's the very same argument here, only B properly dominates C. So we have a thick edge here, but not a thick edge from D to C. Um, again, a similar argument, and then the only slightly more interesting case is the one where we look at the dominators of E, because the dominators of E consists of three alternatives, D, uh, C, and A. Um, and A, C, D, if you look at this sub-tournament, forms a three cycle. Now, strictly speaking, we would need to compute TEQ of this uh, three cyclic tournament. And if we, if we do it properly, we would realize that the only um, TEQ attentive set in the three cycle is the set of all three alternatives. So it would also be implied by neutrality and symmetry, but we don't have these conditions here. But for instance, we can check that, for instance, this two element set here is not TEQ retentive, because if we look at the dominators of this alternative here, well, then the dominators is already the set. The, do the dominators of this alternative already lie outside of this set. They completely lie outside of the set, and therefore the set cannot be TEQ retentive. And that's the case for all two elements alternative, all two elements subsets here. All right. So that uh, all of this taken together shows that TEQ of this um, example tournament consists of the alternatives A, B, C. So. You can already see that probably computing TEQ is, is pretty difficult. Um, and also making any interesting arguments about TEQ seems quite difficult, because even convincing what TEQ does for, for two and three element alternatives, uh, to, to a two or three element uh, vert, uh, tournaments, is, is not completely obvious. Um, but I hope this example at least helps to, to understand how TEQ is defined and be able to compute it for at least some small size tournaments like this one here. Okay, now let's look at the properties of TQ. Um, first, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, it's uh, computing it is NP hard, um, and it remains NP hard even for a low constant number of voters. Uh, the interesting thing is is that it's not even in NP. So before for the bank set, so I, I think I omitted that part. But deciding whether an alternative is in the bank set is also in the class NP. So that problem was NP complete, whereas here this problem is not even contained, or we don't know whether it's contained in the class NP. Um, the best upper bound we have is P space. Um, so this is interesting to those of you who are familiar with computational complexity. So there's this entire polynomial hierarchy. Um, so we have P, NP, and then sigma, 2P, and lots of other classes. And P space is a very large class um, that lies on top of all of these. Um, and there's a huge gap in the complexity of the upper and lower bound here. So that, in other words, it's it could be possible that computing TEQ is P space complete, um, which and that is a sort of interesting open problem. Um, but what's even more interesting about the tournament equilibrium set are the axiomatic properties that this satisfies or not satisfies. It turns out that according because of this like uh, funny recursive definition, even proving the simplest things about TEQ is very difficult. And for a very long time, that's I think more than 20 years, it was even unknown whether TQ satisfies, say, monotonicity, for instance. Like even the most basic properties turned out to be very difficult to prove. Um, so monotonicity for basically all of the other functions that we are discussing in this course is really you, you can come up with a counterexample or you prove that it's, sat that it's satisfied. It's very rare that proving such a simple property turns out to be very difficult. And the funny thing with TQ is, um, that in a series of papers by, by different authors over a larger period of time, uh, many things have been shown to be equivalent. And these are the following statements. Um, so the first thing is this, what I call the Schwartz conjecture. So I said in the definition, it would be nicer if there was always a unique inclusion minimal TQ retentive set. Um, for all the tournaments that people have observed, this is actually the case. So that's why Schwartz also conjectured that this might be true in general. Um, this is equivalent to the, to the statement saying that TEQ satisfies monotonicity. Um, this is also equivalent to saying that TEQ satisfies independence of unchosen alternatives. So these latter three properties are properties that we, which we haven't defined. That's why there's this text in gray here, to be defined. So we are going to define those in, in upcoming lectures. Independence of unchosen alternatives is a property that, for instance, the top cycle satisfies. That is quite nice. So it just says that whenever you invert edges between unchosen alternatives, then the choice set remains the same. 
And for the top cycle, I think it's pretty clear that this property is satisfied. If something is the unique minimal dominant set, you can invert edges between losers and it, it doesn't affect the top cycle in any way. And the same uh, was conjectured for the tournament equilibrium set, which is, is a rather strong stability property. And then there are also choice consistency conditions called alpha hat and gamma hat, which we are going to introduce next week, um, which were not known uh, whether for which it was not known whether they are satisfied by TEQ, and then a certain form of strategy proofness, which we are also learning about uh, in a couple of lectures, uh, called K strategy proofness, which is short for Kelly strategy proofness. Um, so the exact definition of these properties doesn't really matter at this point. Um, what matters is this interesting statement or the series of statements which only show that all of these claims are equivalent to each other. So you can, you can prove that the first one implies the second one, the second one implies the third one, and then in the end you can show for the last one that it implies the first one. Sometimes in previous years this was also a homework exercise, at least for some of these properties, showing that all of these are equivalent. But this doesn't say anything, so this theorem doesn't say anything about the correctness of any, any of these properties. The only thing that this says is that either all of these properties are violated, because if one of these statements is false, then all of these statements are false, or all of them are correct. Um, in, in one case, it would make TEQ a very good majoritarian social choice function, because all of these properties are satisfied. And there are really very few functions that satisfy all of these properties. And um, in the other case, all of these properties would be violated, even monotonicity, which would mean that TQ is, is not really a good social choice function after all. Um, so the state of affairs uh, like 11 years ago was, was this all or nothing deal. So either it's a great uh, majoritarian function or not. And um, so I myself spent quite a time working on this uh, on this conjecture or any of these conjectures because they're all equivalent to each other. So um, I became more and more convinced that the statement is actually true um, because we found weaker versions of this conjecture that, that do hold. So, there, so even, even the uniqueness of minimal dominant sets, which is essential for the top cycle definition, can be seen as a weakening of this Schwartz conjecture here. And then, for instance, in one paper, we came up with an infinite hierarchy of conjectures that are all weaker than this Schwartz conjecture here, and we were able to prove the first four of these, for instance. So this, this is a well-defined infinite hierarchy of conjectures. The first four we could show, um, then, we, then we were stuck, then we wanted to show using induction, for instance, that one conjecture follows from the other, which eventually leads to this uh, Schwartz conjecture. Well, and, and the, the way I'm phrasing it here probably is already apparent um, that uh, Unfortunately, the conjecture is false, <laughs> which means that the tournament equilibrium set violates all of these properties. Um, somewhat surprisingly, I would say, because at least... So, of course, first thing that we, that we did when we were looking um, at this particular statement was to construct counterexamples, of course, uh, first manually and then using a computer. Actually, in 2000, I don't know, 12 or 11, uh, we, we spent several months using a very powerful computer at that time. Um, to, to look for counterexamples, and we didn't encounter any counterexamples. Nevertheless, there, there is a counterexample, so there are several counterexamples which show that all of these statements are incorrect. And the consequence is um, that not only does uh, TEQ uh, violate Schwartz's conjecture, but also all these other statements. So it violates monotonicity, it's not Kelly strategy proof, K strategy proof. It's not independent of unchosen alternatives. It's not even the unique finest majoritarian function satisfying row. So that means uh, when I said we are going further in, in this hierarchy here by using these similar characterizations, I was somehow lying because well, TEQ is not the unique finest function that satisfies row. It does satisfy row, but it's not the, there are other functions that also satisfy row, which are inclusion minimal. Um, so you might wonder why I'm talking about TEQ for a considerable amount of time if, if it's just a bad majoritarian function, but there are some interesting things to be learned, um, not only from the fact that this was open for, for more than 20 years, but also um, from the fact that this theorem here works. So this uh, is something um, that involves lots of mathematicians uh, and some well-known combinatorics experts like Paul Seymour, for instance, or Mar Maria Chudnowski. Um, and the there are some curious facts about this, uh, the way we showed that the Schwartz conjecture is, is false. And this is because the proof is non-constructive. So this theorem only shows the existence of counterexamples, but it, it doesn't give any counterexample. <laughs> 
um, which was kind of frustrating because I've been working for this a couple of, of years actually on, on this tournament equilibrium set and I thought okay of course it was always possible that there exists a counterexample but then I was really curious how this counterexample might look like and, and if you work with tournaments for a very long time you actually give names to small tournaments so, so for all tournaments with up to four or five vertices we, we, we even have some names uh, how to call them so I was really curious so how, how does this tournament look like um, Unfortunately, so this first theorem doesn't give us any insight into this because it uses the probabilistic method, which maybe some of you, at least the mathematicians, may have heard about. So maybe the term probabilistic is a bit misleading here. So it's, it, it shows that there is a counterexample definitely. So it's not that there's a counterexample with high probability or something. It shows that with probability one, there's a counterexample. Um, um, and so this method was, was pioneered by Paul Erdős, for instance, um, and uh, who, who we have heard about uh, in this course previously. And uh, the funny thing is that uh, neither a counterexample nor even the size of a counterexample or the exact size of a counterexample can be deduced from this proof. Um, the only thing that we were able to show is that the smallest counterexample of this kind that we were constructing in, in this theorem or this proof here requires about 10 to the 136 alternatives. Um, and that's a pretty large number. Um, so th that's one of the reasons why I said there are important lessons to be learned from TEQ. So it's sometimes counterexamples can be large. So the example that we have seen in today's lecture where the bank set was strictly contained in the uncovered set, I said it's the smallest counterexample or the smallest example of this kind. I think it had seven vertices. So that was already relatively large. So I was prepared to have a counterexample of, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 vertices. But 10 to the 136 is really immense. So just for comparison, so the, the estimated number of atoms in the known universe, so nobody knows precisely of course, but it, it's estimated to be 10 to the 80, um, so which is much smaller. So that means there's no way you could ever, like, say, draw this counterexample on a piece of paper or something, <laughs> no matter how large your paper is, at least not in this universe. Um, and um, well, this, of course, has some interesting consequences with respect to the axiomatic method, because uh, I'm, I, I'm not claiming that this is the smallest count example. It is not. We know by now that it's not the smallest one. Um, but um, if there are counterexamples for certain axiomatic statements that require a very large number of alternatives, um, you could argue that the failure of these properties um, um, is not really much of a problem. And in particular for TEQ, it also turns out that the way these equivalences have been shown is that the, if you have a counterexample for the Schwarz conjecture, then you have a similar sized counterexample for, um, for monotonicity, for instance, of any of these other properties. And if TEQ violates monotonicity for a number of, of alternatives or candidates in an election which is larger than the number of atoms in the universe, well, then we shouldn't really be bother about this kind of problem. Um, but as I said, so there, have been, there has been some progress on this. So first, uh, and this was actually at a time when we were already, when we didn't know whether the conjecture was true or not, um, we used um, exhaustive search um, to, to verify that the conjecture holds for all tournaments with up to 12 vertices. That maybe doesn't sound like a big deal, but I think even nowadays you cannot do more than 12. So we can uh, exhaustively search all tournaments of, with up to 12 vertices, but 13 is already too large. So even uh, more than 10 years after that. Um, there was a follow-up paper where they showed that even for up to 14 alternatives, the conjecture holds. Clearly not by exhaustive search, because I mentioned you cannot do more than 12. Um, and of course, we also looked for count example using random search. So as I mentioned earlier, for we spent like months using very strong computers to look for count examples. I think we were basically looking at tournaments with, which had about 50 vertices, because for larger tournaments, we couldn't really compute TEQ. So as I mentioned earlier, computing is, it's, is NP hard. It may even be P space complete. So that means for very large tournaments, there's no, no way uh, to compute TEQ efficiently. So even if you look for count examples, we couldn't really look at the large ones. Um, we made some significant progress uh, some years later, where we constructed a counterexample, uh, which, with the help of a computer, so there was some, some human insight and help of a computer, which only has 24 alternatives. So I, I could have shortened the story significantly if I introduced that one first. Um, but this one already is quite complicated too. And the funny thing is that for constructing this counterexample, we we, we construct a tournament in which there are two disjoint minimal TQ retentive set and both have the same internal structure, so they're both of size 12, 
And we, we had, like, the, the human argument was that we take one tournament and we make a copy of it next to it, and then the intermediate edges we, are, we were doing in a very intricate and precise way. We only didn't know how the internal structure of these components needed to look like. And then we used exhaustive search to look for all tournaments. And as I said, 12 alternatives is all you can do. There's not, even nowadays, you cannot do more than 12 alternatives. So we were just lucky that, that this was barely at the boundary of what we can do efficiently to find a counterexample of this type. So we have 24 alternatives because it's 2 times 12. So 2 times the same component with some intermediate edges in between, um, which does form a counterexample. But nevertheless, so if, if we look for random tournaments, we, we never ever encountered a counterexample, even by looking at, at billions of tournaments, um, which again uh, implies that in principle TQ is severely flawed. Um, so these properties are violated. There even exists a moderately sized counterexample, but you will, I almost promise that you will never enc encounter a counterexample. It took us a very long time to just found a single instance of a counterexample. Um, and this casts some doubt uh, on the axiomatic method because you might wonder uh, how meaningful the existence of such a counterexample is if, um, if, 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 if it will never appear in practice. So it's basically like in, with the axiomatic method, you just have this uh, uh, yes or no thing. So either an axiom is satisfied or it's not satisfied. You don't really care how often an axiom is violated. Um, what's also interesting from a technical perspective is that um, after 23 years, the conjecture of a political scientist, so Thomas Schwartz uh, is a political scientist, so he's not really a mathematician who was trying to construct something very intricate um, and, and, and uh, confusing, um, but this conjecture has been refuted using uh, like, uh, like a mm, hardcore tool from mathematics called the probabilistic method. Um, and yeah, in, in general, um, what, what this story about TEQ tells us is that um, there may be social choice functions um, which do violate certain properties, but which are still doing very well in practice. I wouldn't say that this is the case for TEQ because Next week, of course, is, uh, is another majoritarian social choice function, um, which I think satisfies uh, yeah, basically all of the properties that we had in this previous list of conjectures for TEQ, um, except the ones that don't apply, like the Schwartz conjecture, for instance, that doesn't apply. And, and this other majoritarian function, on average, just selects um, much less alternatives than TEQ does. So um, basically, it turned out that this definition of TEQ, I think, uh, was like a um, like demanding too much, uh, so it's uh, we, we weakened these uh, expansion consistency conditions further and further, and then it turned out that for rho we don't even have the statement that there's a unique inclusion min or that there's a unique finest social choice function that satisfies rho. I think that also emphasizes how important uh, it was because I, I, I think I did emphasize when we had TC and UC and banks that the fact that there is a unique uh, finest function that satisfies the given property is already interesting by itself. Not only that it is TC and UC and banks, but just the fact that one of these, uh, that there is, is always a unique finest function that satisfies the property. Okay. Um, so here's just a final overview of uh, the majoritarian functions we had so far. So they do form a hierarchy because this inclusion of TEQ and banks holds independently of any of these conjectures. So, and as I said, it's a homework exercise, a star exercise. So for this exercise, um, so nothing of these unproven or incorrect statements actually, because now we know that they are not correct, can be assumed. Um, uh, top cycle is the finest one satisfying beta plus, then we went to gamma and rho plus. And then in the last column here, I denoted the asymptotic runtime of the best known algorithms. So the top cycle and the uncovered set we can compute efficiently. So this funny number for the uncovered set comes from matrix multiplication, if you recall. Um, and for the bank set and the tournament equilibrium set, so those have been shown to be NP-hard. So that means, it doesn't mean because we don't know whether the P versus NP conjecture is true, but um, these numbers in red here just mean that the best known algorithms require exponential time. So we are not aware of any polynomial time algorithms for computing the bank set and the tournament equilibrium set, which is, of course, can be seen like a negative axiomatic property of these functions. Well, tournament equilibrium set has some other problems as well, at least for large tournaments. Um, but the bank set um, is, is nice, but the fact that it cannot be computed efficiently, of course, just like with Kemeny's rule, is, is a negative message. OK, so I guess I'm doing well on time. So this is basically what I wanted to say 
about majoritarian functions. Um, one other thing that I just realized is, so if in this picture you might, for instance, also wonder where the Copeland set resides. And uh, I think it has been shown in, on the last exercise sheet, you have shown that Copeland is a subset of UC, I think, right? Um, right, and in the upcoming exercise sheet, uh, we will give you a concrete tournament with which you can then show that Copeland and Banks may be disjoint. Okay, and, and that means Copeland is contained in UC, but it's, it's not contained in Banks. There are tournaments for which these don't even overlap. That's why usually if you, if you write down Copeland here, you depicted something like this.